I'm standing in the lounge of my restaurant. It's between shifts. There's no one around me. In walks a vendor. A man comes up much too close to me, leans in, touches my shoulder and says, Honey, you want to get the owner for me? Every professional panel that I've been on, business or entrepreneurship panel, I'm asked, how do you manage lifestyle and balance? None of my male panelists asked this. I've been on a CNBC docu-series, a business series on restaurateurs in New York. I had a restaurant in New York for 10 years. And social media was a flame. Not on the business, not on the food, but she's too aggressive. She's too direct. These are things we just take for granted on a daily basis. Few little overt examples of sexism, we build our armor thicker around us and we move on. But today is different. Today is the zeitgeist and the moment of Me Too. Women are speaking across, are speaking across and aflame across every sector. From media, to recording industry, entertainment, tech, VCs, the Department of Justice, gymnasts, college students, women who have been groped by the president. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. And our hope is that through this movement, it's going to seep in and the workplace will no longer be a landmine that we have to maneuver around. The casting couch is going to be a lexicon of the past. However, if you take Me Too to its extreme success, extreme utopian success even, let's say every woman is respected and safeguarded across every sphere. It's still far from success. My central thesis is that there is a fundamental and systemic problem in our societies. It's getting worse and women are being left behind in the corridors of politics and economic empowerment. It's not for lack of qualification. Women have a third of bachelor's and master's degrees way more than men. They're ambitious. They aspire for more. And we, as an affluent country with all the resources that we have, have very little excuse. So what's driving this? All the research has shown that the US alone will be 15% more productive, 4 trillion more in GDP. Every country which has more, every company which has more women at the top does better. So what's holding us back? Are we such a misogynist society? Or are American women inferior? Or is it just lack of political and economic and corporate leadership. Are our politicians too wrapped up in campaign finance and re-election to really care about fundamental issues? Or are they so tied up legislating our bodies? 300 to 500 restrictions a year across federal, state and local levels. Let me give you some facts, and they're not pretty. Number one, when it comes to parity for our gender, for women across the world, and this is measured by the World Economic Forum on very four reasonable measures. Health, education, political and economic empowerment. The US, our great country, ranks 49th in the world. 
We dropped four positions just in 2017 alone. When it comes to political parity for women, you won't even hazard a guess as to where we are. We are hundredth. Hundredth. In 1995, we were 53rd. This is not progress. At this rate, it is estimated that women, half the electorate, half the voice, will get political parity by AD 3126. Let's talk about economic parity. When it comes to corporate statistics, you know it. I mean, all of you know it. Less than 5% or around 5% hovering of Fortune 500 CEOs. Barely 20% of the board and C-suites or even less. When it comes to entrepreneurial statistics, my field and arena, women own businesses are 40%. Not bad, right? 40% of all the businesses in the country, but they generate 4% of the revenue, 99.9% are small businesses, they employ only 8% of the population and are starved for capital. They get less than 2% of the VC dollars, less than 4% of VC deals and less than 4% of all SBA loans. So what's wrong with this picture? I'm Rohini Jay. Grew up in India. My father was a fighter pilot for the Indian Air Force. Lived 10 different cities across my childhood. Um, my mom was an iconoclast, Alice Cooper to ABBA playing lady. Cooked uh, amazing for us for, from spaghetti to shoshe mach, which is Indian fish curry. Life was fairly freewheeling, none of the intense demanding pressures of today, other than we had to study and do well in school, my brother and I. And it was, it was unsaid, but it was obvious that the sky was the limit for us. There were no limits just because I was a girl. When did that sky shrink? Ever since I was 12, I grew up with the one desire to save humanity and work at the World Bank. Came to the, came to the US for a PhD in economics, worked at the World Bank in the glamorous realm of privatizing water and sewage. <laughs> Loved it actually. And then went into McKinsey and worked with Fortune 100 companies at the C-suites, with the boards, with the CEOs and then went entrepreneurial. And through this professional journey over time, the one thing I kept noticing was the reality of the so-called proverbial glass ceiling. It just got rarer and rarer to see women at the top. And for those of us who were working in there, it got a little tiresome trying to go along with the, you know, the so-called locker room jokes, not being able to, or not wanting to go for golfing with your clients, or not interested in the late night dinners, or not having mentors and advisors that you could really, really relate to, went entrepreneurial after that. 15 years ago, I decided to, take it, to change career paths and opened Vermilion, my Indian Latin restaurant, and then it hit me even harder. If I thought that the glass ceiling was low, what I call the gastro ceiling is fundamentally lower. Didn't know a thing about restaurants. Opened it to much acclaim, got lucky, best new restaurants, tra travel and leisure, USA Today, town and country. Everything was just fine, but I noticed around me in my industry, cooking, the so-called domain of women, when it comes to the professional level, has very few lead executive chefs. 
By a Bloomberg poll, less than 7% of leading executive chefs are women. And the women who are in the industry, even though 50% of culinary and hospitality schools are women, the ones who are there tend to be in the softer side of the business. They're either relegated there or something happens along the way. And by the softer side, I mean things like the pastry or the coal station or prep. Much like in corporate America, what you would call HR or marketing or support. Not in the core. And these are women who will never lead or own their kitchens. When it comes to the mega restaurateur, you can think of so many men. But the mega restaurateur woman is almost an extinct breed. Think of, I mean, can you think of any? One hand. You can roll off Tom Colicchio, Daniel Golu, Richard Melman, the Let Us Entertain You Boca group, Stephen Starr. I mean, it's unending. Why? Why don't women own their own kitchens and their own businesses? A couple of reasons. One is, it is a very tough industry for anybody to enter and sustain. 81% 81, 81 of restaurants fail within three years. High capital intensity and a ticking time bomb. Liability, customers, a very fickle market. But in addition to that, there are also some intrinsic structural factors within the restaurant industry that are very that create an environment that's toxic for women. The workforce tends to be highly uneducated, inexperienced, first jobs, alcohol, proximity, physical contact, long hours, late nights, and managers and owners who operate with complete impunity, like fiefdoms. That being said, <coughs> There are some organizations that are trying their level best to turn things around. But it is an $800, $800 billion industry that employs 10% of the workforce of the US. So there's very little that just these few organizations like Toklas, LDE, Women Chefs and Restaurants, and the James Beard Foundation, which I'm a member of. We founded programs, one, to enable women entrepreneurs to scale, two, to take relatively junior women and push them to an accelerated program to become executive chefs and owners. There's very little that these few can do for this massive behemoth of an industry. So then what then? Because this is a parallel, the lack of women's leadership and presence and the toxic environment that we see in our workforce go hand in hand. What really is the solution to go beyond B2 across all the sectors that we mentioned? Here's where I would challenge our leadership, our political and corporate leadership to dare to do more, to dare to aspire for more. And here, I'll start with some actions for our government. Number one is commit to a half or a 50% women cabinet and Congress. It's not unheard of. Over 100 countries in the world have electoral quotas. We are half the voice and half the electorate. Canada has done it with great success. They have a half cabinet. Or we can wait for 80, 31, 26 and just hope. Number two for the government, finance women entrepreneurs. There is so much that can be done, including passing the Small Business Ownership Act, mandating that the SBA gives 50% of their revenue to women, not their revenue, I'm sorry, their loans to women. Currently, it's 4%. Increasing funding to women's business centers, 
100, around 100 of them around the country that provide technical skills to women, increasing or doubling microloans. And the third is commit to giving women one year of paid child care, working women. This adds up to barely $30,000 for a year of paid childcare, and it is well worth it to retain a woman in the workforce over the course of her life. It's gonna pay back in spades in GDP. It's morally the right thing to do. And women should not be penalized for propagating mankind. When it comes to corporations, there's so much we can do again. Why can't CEOs commit that gender parity is gonna be one of their top three priorities? Why can't they say it, declare it, set targets, be visible, and be evaluated on it? Why can't they do a 30% board uh, presence by women? By the, by the way, this does exist in many countries. Why can't CEOs formalize an internal senior women sponsorship to build the pipeline and make sure that women come, come up through their companies? The third set of actions or the third set of things I would talk about would be for women themselves. This is owning your own career model. Whether you're gonna be a poet, a pianist, a scientist, or anybody, my counsel to you is invest in yourself. There are so, and by invest in yourself, I'm talking about business and financial literacy. There are, like I mentioned, 107 women's business centers around the country. They are virtually free. Six weeks of a plan but you will learn how to speak like an owner, an investor, the language of bankers, the language of financiers. Basics like a PNL, an invested capital statement, a balance sheet, raising funding, building scale if you, or, or external resources if you ever go entrepreneurial. So investing in yourself is primary. All the women who work in my restaurants go through this program. Number two is expand your ambition. So being in the soft, softer side of the business is not sufficient. Exit the softer side, seek more responsibility, seek initiatives, go to the core of operations. Number three would be be your own biggest self-advocate. I used to think that if you sit down and hunger and do good work, the world will stop and notice. Not true. You have to market yourself. You have to get your own voice out. So be visible, learn to ask. Practice asking every day so that when, you, when the bigger moments come, you're ready. And please know that you don't have to be nurturing and nice all the time. In fact, sometimes it's not the right thing to do and it can be a handicap to you. So, to the comment that I made at the beginning where criticism for my communication style, here's a fact. When women are evaluated, 73% of them are told that they are too aggressive. New York Times. 2% of men get that same feedback. It's okay to not be nice. Get over likability, it is overrated. Number four for women is, and actually this is not just for women, for women and men, pay it forward. Support others, support other women, support other men. Much like you need mentorship, do it for others, and it will come back in spades. So there's been, coming back to the Me Too movement, there's, you know, there's a lot of hand-wringing, 
asked, forums, discussions, roundtables, so much of activity around this, conferences. Not very much is changing across industries, though. Very little action, certainly nothing on the legislative front. And nothing much is going to change as long as these activities are led only by women. We have to galvanize all the good men who exist among us. And there are so many. I'm married to one. <laughs> And I have fundamental faith in the decency and humanity of so many men. So let's get them with us and let's work towards our goals. And our goal is to own nothing short of half our sky. And when I say half our sky, I'm talking about half the political power as presidents, as governors, senates, federals, local, whatever level. Half the economic power, nothing short of that. I haven't spoken about my sentiments about religion, and I won't, that's a whole separate discussion. But if you want us to be the believers and within the faith, I think it is only fair that we ask that we represent half the power in this sphere too. And only then, only then will the whole discussion around empowerment, around Me Too, around Time's Up, all of that become redundant. And that, to me, is success. So, to close, I would say, I can't wait for my daughters to get back, not just my daughters, all our daughters to get back half our sky. Thank you.